usually I'm used to like speaking to like high school and middle school kids and you know I like, go to schools and stuff. I've never really had an adult audience before, you know, some of the people here. But uh, well, I think you'll get a good story out of it. I think it's pretty um, entertaining what people thought. Shut up. Remind me your name again. Ari. Ari. Okay. Now what did, what do you want to do? In for like oh. for later in life. Oh. What do you want to um, do like as a job or something? Either a musician or EMT. Okay, musician or EMT. You? Engineer. Engineer. Okay. You? Um, an author. Author. Okay. Remind me yours. Um, Musician. I said EMT. EMT? And yours? Engineer. Engineer. When we start out, like, you know, young and everything, we have something, like, deep down, we have something in our heart that tells us, like, this is what we want to do. Like, you know you want to be an author, right? You just know it. All right, EMT, engineer, same thing, right? Most people actually don't go after what they want to do. There's a lot of people that don't even make it past high school. They start making the wrong choices. They do the partying and everything like that. Before you know it, they wind up in an apartment complex, you know, run down trying to find any job they get their hands on because of the bad choices they make. There's others that do what the family wants them to do. Maybe it's to run a family business or have like a respectable professional, like an accountant or something like that. But really, you just maybe want to be, you know, a mechanic or something like that. Then there's some others that maybe are get a little intimidated with being an author or because it's really hard to get there or something. People think that, so they'll settle for a decent paycheck. Most people fall into a trap like this. Very rarely people go after what they want. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to go after what you want with all your heart. Now, as you guys know, I don't have to give an introduction because this was how it was advertised. I'm on the TV show Deadliest Catch. I've been on it for four years now. And I'm supposed to tell you a story about how I got on there. And really, it's not about me tonight. It's actually really like you know about you guys. Has anyone even ever heard of this movie? Yeah. Okay, I don't watch a lot of movies, um, but this is this is like a, one of my favorites. You guys know who Matt Damon is? Yeah. Okay, okay. No, some people don't. I actually went like to one like to speak one spot. They didn't know who Matt Damon was, but in the movie, Matt Damon plays a poker player, and he's kind of at a crossroads, wondering if he wants to be a poker player or to be a lawyer. And his business law uh, business law professor. Martin Landau was telling a story about how when he was a kid, for generations in his family, they were to be the men in his family were to be rabbis, and it was his calling to become one as well. Now, he was studying to become one, and he was really brilliant at it. The only problem is that the whole time he was studying in the Talmud that he never saw God. And, you know, he tried to lie to himself because his family was depending on him and everything like that, and, but he just couldn't do it. So his family sent him away to distant, live with distant cousins, and that's where he got immersed in the law. And he just he loved it. And he just like he knew this is what he really wanted to do. So he went back to his family, and he says, "I want to be a judge." And you know his family was completely outraged with this decision. He says, "They said, well, if you do this, we're never going to talk to you." To that day, he never spoke to his family again. And but his, before he left, his mom gave him a knowing look, like, "I know this is what you have to do. This is your life. I don't agree with it, but I understand." So Matt Damon asks him, if you had to do it all over again, would you have made the same choices? And he goes, well, what choice? The last thing I got out of the issue was this, that we can't run from who we are. Now, freedom, I looked this up on Google, is the power or right to act, speak, think, as one wants without hindrance or restraint. We have all these choices in our life, but only, only one is ultimately going to make you happy. So therefore, I thought of this, freedom is not a choice, but ultimately only one thing you want to do, and that's what will make you happy. Now, there's a book, it's one of my favorite books that I'll later get into, it's called The Alchemist. And there are four obstacles a person must face, it says. One, everything we want to do is impossible. So to be an author, for example, I want to write two, believe it or not. Um, I got 220 pages down, actually. But 
you know, they say, well, it's really hard, the competition is really heavy and everything. They were saying that to Dr. Seuss, and look where he was. People were saying to him, left, you know, left and right, no, no, no. And if you give up on yourself, then you're already your own worst enemy. Then there's the other thing, and what we want to do will hurt the others we love. But really, those who care about you, they'll always be by your side. Then there's the fear of defeats on the head. So say if someone wants to be a lawyer or a doctor, for example, there's eight years of schooling in college, about $50,000 a year you know, to go to school, so you're gonna rack up a lot of loans. And some people, they find that really intimidating, and they just give up, and then they think that school's too hard. Then there's also fear of realizing your dream you fought for. Your first and ten and goal line, you know, you, you work so hard to get there, and then you feel you don't deserve it. I want you to guys to face those fears. Now, my story is actually I went to West Bankfield High School, and I'm just right next door. Many focused on being accepted, doing what was cool. And I honestly, I didn't want to live their way because I saw what happened. I mean, basically, I had friends, you know, they were doing the partying and everything like that, making the wrong choices. And now they're in a rundown apartment trying to find any job they can get their hands on. And I saw that, and I just didn't want, I didn't want that to be me. So I went to college, and to be honest with you, I really didn't have a good time. It was a very competitive school. I went to school in uh, Concordia, Montreal. They wouldn't say hi to you. They wouldn't give you the time of day. I was working two to three jobs while going to school full time. By day, I was a suit salesman. By night, I was a janitor. And on the weekends, I was a pizza delivery guy. I would work from 3 o'clock all the way to 6.30 in the morning. And then, basically, I was working so hard, and I was going to school full time. My grades went down hard. And eventually, at the end, I was burnt out from everything. I was on break. And I was at my grandparents' place. My family, my grandfather turns on, deadliest catch. And I just knew I really wanted to do it. It just looked like so much fun. I really wanted to try it. And I mean, just the waves and everything, like, it, just, it just thrilled my bones. And I thought about it. Like, wow, I, maybe I might want to do this. Now, I went back to school. And I had a lot of internships offered. Like I had an internship for sports radio. Really cool jobs. But I really didn't want to do it. So I looked into fishing. And I had, I got this found this website that had like 300 phone numbers actually out there and I, I got I got all these phone numbers it was like a subscription to find a job and I think it was like a hundred dollars or something but I just went the trial membership got all the phone numbers and started calling nobody would bother to hire me because a they didn't know who I was B uh, they didn't know if I was a drinker or a druggie and C because of the maritime law if I didn't work out that they would have to buy me a plane ticket all the way back to Massachusetts and return me to the Port of Ohio so they didn't want to take a risk on me like that. There's only about three or four people that actually talked to me and you know were like they were maybe thinking about you know taking me on. So there's this one guy, Jim, and he goes, Well, if you come here, I'll pick you up from the airport. And I go, Well, Jim, I gotta ask you a question. Like, if I go up there, am I gonna even get a job? And he goes, Well, I don't know. I mean, you say you're a hard worker, you're not a drinker, you don't do drugs and everything. There might be a shop. So I said, you know what? I was gonna go up to Alaska. My family, on the other hand, though, they were not happy. Their thoughts, it was a very dangerous job. You can get killed. Those guys would chew you up and eat you alive. You may want to drop out, and then where are you without a college degree? My family yelled at me, so they were very disappointed in me. And they also said that if I did this, there was no more funding for school that I was actually on my own. I caved in. I said, my family's right. I've got to finish school and everything. I went back to school. Of course, the pizza man was happy to see me. I was working two weeks, you know, and I was just there. And two weeks later, I was at my friend Maria and Phil's house. And uh, they were really great people. And I, I, told, I was telling them, like, you know what? My family's right. I mean, I, sh you know, I shouldn't go out to Alaska. It's a dangerous job. I can get hurt. And she told me, she goes, well, listen, there's a guy that was jogging up and down this street. And for some reason, one day, he was, he was running a certain way, and he hit his head. He fell, and he hit his head. And he died. And he goes, you, I mean, you could really, I mean, you could have an accident anywhere. You can get a car accident tomorrow. You know, I mean, you could get injured up there, but at least if you go up there, at least you'll be living. And I was like, okay. And while I was delivering pizzas, I was reading this one book called The Four Hour Work Week, like an audio tapes and everything like that. And this was an okay book. 
But actually what was more important, I still have this like from seven, eight years ago, were these list of questions that were in here and that was really important for me. In the book, it said, what is the worst that could happen if you did what you considered? List doubts, fears, and what ifs that pop up. Steps that, what are the steps that I could take to bring things back under control? What is it costing you physically, mentally to postpone action? What am I waiting for? Measure your cost of inaction. These were my answers. If I did what I considered, I could die, become permanently scarred, lose my legs, become a paraplegic, etc. But at least I would live my life to the fullest. If I am permanently scarred, at least I would have my family and friends around me. In order to bring things back under control, I could go back to school, I could find a job and be back to where I left off. Everything would be A-OK. -okay. The benefits of more probable scenarios are that I would come back more self-confident, have money in my pocket. I would make great friends, great memories, and would be a better person. As I am postponing action, I am losing zest for life. My cost of inaction would be living each day less and less. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go up to Alaska this time. I continue made, making phone calls. I moved out of my apartment. I turned down my internship for sports radio. And this time I thought I was going to stand up to my family. Now, before I left, there's, this is my law professor. And he, before I left, he gave me four books to read. Lyndon Johnson, The American Dream, Lincoln, Crime and Punishment, and Moby Dick. He told me to go back to school and get an education. He said, no one can take the degree away from you. The knowledge you gain will help you out later in life. Yeah, at least owe it to yourself. And I did, and I'm happy I made that decision, and I got my degree. Now, my family this time. But this time, I was actually ready. I, I decided I couldn't live for my family. This was ultimately my life, and I had to live it for me. Before I left, they had me these questions. Do you have a job? No. Do you know anyone there? A fisherman named Jim. I spoke with him over the phone. Do you know where you're going to stay? Not yet. Who's picking up at the airport? Jim. Do you know anyone else besides Jim? No. Just Jim. <laughs> After hours of them shouting, they said, there's nothing we can do. Be careful. We love you, and please keep in touch. Before leaving, I stumble upon this book called The Alchemist. It's at my best friend's house, Elena. And uh, I stumbled upon it, like, Elena, what's this book? And she goes, take that book with you. This book, it's about a, like a young man, and uh, he's going on his, this adventure to see the pyramids in Egypt. I felt like that same guy, except I was going up to Alaska. And up in Alaska, we have something called the book club, where when we're done with a book, we give it to someone for them to read it. And I want to keep that tradition, and I actually want to give it to you. Remind me your name again. Gracie. Gracie. How do you spell that? G-R-A-C-I-E. G-R-A-C-I-E. It's one of my favorite books. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I went up to Alaska. I was kind of like Lottie Daw on the plane until I saw this out the window of the airport. And I, it, it just hit me like a ton of bricks because one, mountains like that don't, are not around in New England. And I was just shocked because I'm actually doing my thing. I'm actually going up to Alaska doing what I want to do. And it was just, it was just, I was so happy. I was literally dancing at the airport. I, people were looking at me like I was insane. And I was just so happy. The next day, I arrive in Kodiak. It looks like this. I was like, what the heck am I doing here? The airport, no lie, was no bigger than this room. That's the size of the airport in Kodiak, Alaska. Jim, the guy who says he's going to pick me up from the airport, he doesn't pick me up. I call him up and I say, you know, hey Jim, I'm here. He goes, well, I'll just hitchhike you into town. You'll be fine. I have my bag right here. And I'm like, Where, what am I supposed to do? So I'm on a dirt road with my bag and I'm hitchhiking. The first guy that, come, that pulls over is a police officer with a badge. And I was like, oh shoot, I thought I was in trouble and everything. And uh, he's like, well, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I said, I'm here, I, I'm not from around here, and I I'm, came up here to look for a job. My ride was said he was going to be here. He didn't show up. He goes, well, hop in. And he was a really nice guy, and he helped me out. He brought me into town and everything like that. Immediately as I got back, but got in, I started walking the docks. I had this suitcase with me, and I was walking the docks like this. People were looking like this, and I was like, what the heck is going on? I see Jim, the guy who was supposed to pick me up at the airport. He's shocked to see me. I go, well, what's going on? He goes, out of hundreds of people that called me, you're the first guy that actually showed up. And he goes, well, all right, well, do you have any advice for me? He goes, yeah. He goes, first, 
don't get on a boat that's in rough shape because your life depends on it. Two, don't get on a boat without signing a contract because you'll get screwed over. Keep walking the docks, start at seven o'clock in the morning, and, you, and if you just keep staying persistent, you just might get a job. So I said, okay. And he also said, post your resume up at the coffee shop. Now, at the coffee shop, I don't know if you guys can see this, but they're like little index cards. You know, they write, you know, like fishing experience, you know, like five years long lining and everything. This is my resume right here. Suit salesman, pizza delivery guy, you know, uh, cashier at a lemonade stand. Absolutely has nothing to do with fishing. And I had to post this out. Basically, try going to, I don't know, H&R Block or like Bank of America with a little index card saying your fishing experience. That was like the same thing, really. So I definitely stood out, I will say that. Now, I, I have to backpedal here. While I was at that coffee shop, I didn't have a place to stay. And it was weird. I don't know how to explain it, but there was this woman that was there. And she, I didn't have a place to stay. She helped me set up, like get a tent and everything. And then after that, she got me set up. I never saw her again. I remember the last time, the last thing I remember about her was I was filling out an index card for the campsite. And I looked at and I was like, how do I figure this out? She goes, I don't know. You're going to have to figure things out on your own. And I never saw her again. This was my place to stay for two and a half weeks. I told my family that I bought a house. I was camping out for two and a half weeks. Now, it doesn't look like much, but the backyard view is incredible. This is Fort Abercrombie, an old World War II base. You can see pillboxes all around. You can see whales out of the water, bald eagles flying around. It's a sight to see. That's literally less than a 100-yard walk. That's what I saw. I get up every morning about 6.30. I walked down the dirt road about 15, 20 minutes, and then let's say about, I'd hitchhike into town, it'd take me about 15, 20 minutes on top of that. I'd get into town, walk these docks right here, and then I'd walk about a mile down the road, go to the, go to the shipyard, talk to those boats, go across the bridge, down the hill, over onto the other side into Dog Bay to ask for work. And there's a lot of boats there, but you can see for yourself, this is just one little snapshot. There are probably at least 150, 200 boats just on Dog Bay alone. What they'd say, every day I heard a no. I was like, Dual, did you post your resume up at the coffee shop? They go, yes. Well, all I got to say is just keep walking the docks. I heard that 150 times a day. Eventually, I got sick of it. While I was there, because I didn't have any experience, I had to learn my knots because that's the only thing that I had, an asset that I had. So I had to learn the Carrick Bend. I had to get really good at these knots. There, there's one. I'll give that to you. Carrick Bend, a bowling. Who's got a pen? There, thank you. Bowling. And a clove hitch. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I bet you didn't expect that. I had to get really good at learning those knots. I practiced that like hundreds and hundreds of times a day just while I was walking the docks. I ran out of money, so I was staying at the Brother Francis shelter. I was also staying at random people's houses. I got so desperate for a job. This is, this is the original thing right here. It's super G. G stands for greenhorn. I don't know if you know that. But I got so desperate for a job, I put this on my chest and advertised that I was willing to work for half the wages just to get a job. First boat I got on was the Patricia, G Patricia K. The boat stalled in the middle of the harbor because the guy, the captain of the boat, put water in the fuel tank and fuel in the water tank. I quickly left that boat. The next guy was like a druggie who couldn't stop screaming his head off. I quickly left that boat. After three weeks, I was sick of it. I didn't have a job. Basically, I, I, I say this, I willed a job. I went to someone and I go, do you have a job? I'm looking for a job. Do you know who's hiring? They go, well, maybe this person. Okay, well, I go talk to this person. Eventually, one thing led to another. I actually show up to this guy's house. His name's Tommy Johnson. He runs the Kathy Ann. I went to his house to ask for a job. This guy, the whole time while I was working for him, he was shocked on how new I was. I didn't know a thing about a boat. He told me, go get the prop from the locker. I was like, what's that? that you mean the propeller? I, I didn't know. 
he was hard on me. Every day he said I couldn't do this job. And I'll never forget this. I, after, you know, I got fired. After two weeks worth of work, and I remember, I remember it very clearly. I, uh, the guy, I was the cook on the boat, and he was, he's, he was pretending to act deaf. And I go, sir, would you like me to cook dinner? He goes, what? I go, sir, would you like me to cook dinner? He goes, what? I go, sir, would you like me to cook dinner? Now I'm really mad. And he's, what? I go, this is what I said, honest to God. I said your mom called. It was a weird, dumb thing. I lost my job. I had a check for $170 because the fishery wasn't in. And I started walking the docks again. And the lesson learned, I talk too much. It's what the captain wants, and it's not what you want. Now, what's next? I had no job for another couple of weeks. I actually pawned the gold necklace that my mom gave to me because I needed money. And then I get on this boat, the Neva. This guy was known as the frying pan man because eight years back he hit a crew member over the head with a frying pan and threw him over the side to try to kill him. I didn't know I was working for this guy. The guy was a complete screamer. Nope, I'm not making this up. I needed this job. So I just was stuck my head down and said, yes sir, no sir kind of a thing. Now, we, I worked for one week. We came back loaded, but the fishery was closed for a little bit, so he gave me a draw for $100, said come back in the morning. So I said, okay. That night, I had a staph infection on my knee. I got sent to the hospital for one week, and I lost my jaw. I, 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 I was really, really upset. However, the guy that replaced me had a seal bomb thrown in his bunk. Does anyone know what that is? No. no. Okay, you guys know what dynamite is, right? Yeah. Basically, the guy threw a little tiny stick of dynamite into this guy's bunk, blew up a chunk of his stomach. He got sent to the hospital. The coast, you know, he got, and the guy, he went to jail, and the boat got seized by the Coast Guard. I, if I didn't have that staph infection on my knee, I could have been that guy. <laughs> so the guy, he never paid me my earnings. Why? Because I never signed a contract, and I neglected Jim's advice. I was broke with less than $100, and I just got out of the hospital with no place to go. I officially hit rock bottom. My realization, I was at my friend's house. It cannot get any worse than this. It cannot, and right now I'm living and breathing. If it cannot get any worse than this, it can only get what? Better. Exactly. That night, I found a place to stay. I snuck into a laundromat that night. No joke. I started walking the docks again. Steve Branson, that bowling, I met this guy, and like I, I tied that behind my, my back and I just flung it at him. He was impressed, so he gave me work on the side until I found a job. I found another job, but I didn't make any money. It was on the Pacific Cloud. The guy was a new guy. He didn't know what he was doing. It was a great year for salmon fishing, and I was missing out. So I needed a job. I was walking the docks again, and the people thought I was nuts because I was literally at the dock like this just looking like a gargoyle. And, the, and people were like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? And one guy looks at me and goes, hey buddy, are you okay? And uh, I go, yeah, I'm just trying to find a, a boat that comes in and as soon as it comes in, I'm gonna pounce on it because I really need a job. And he goes, well, do you have any experience? I go, about two weeks worth. And he kind of laughs and he goes, well, my name's Greg, I'm on the Cheryl Ann, come see me in the morning. And that was my first big break. A week and a half in, I made $2,600. It wasn't enough to go back to school though. So I got this job offer to go on the sea bar. And how many of you guys here watch the show? Okay. okay, okay, that's okay. Well, on the show, there are these like big 800 pound, you know, cage pots and everything like this. This is kind of the same thing, but not nearly like the rough weather. So if you could do this, there's a good chance that you could do crab, crab fishing. Basically, it was like my ultimate test. I was nervous, not only because of that, but because the guys that I was working with were constantly running in and out of jail. There was this one big guy, Rob, I'll never forget him. Smart, brilliant guy, he was a big, big guy. And I thought he was gonna beat me up. I actually called this uh, Toltec woman, like I have a little bit of a spiritual sign, but I called her up and I said, listen, if I beat me, I feel like I'm gonna get beat up. And she goes, well, first of all, you don't know who you are to begin with. Your job is to do whatever you can to survive on that boat. So I did, I, did, I just was a yes sir, no sir kind of guy. And they actually took a liking to me. My job on the sea bar, I was a stack man. Basically what that means is you run up on top of the pots, maybe about 30, 35 feet 
high, hook a pot up, bring it down, run back up, hook it up, bring it down again. That was my job. We were working 20 hours a day. Physical labor, I never worked that hard in my life. My hands were clawed the next morning. I actually had to go into a sink and put it under hot water just to break them open. They were feeding me energy drinks just to sustain me because I never worked that hard. I was just so concentrated on my job, I was neglecting food and water. So they were just constantly, here, here's an energy drink, and they were feeding me just, to, just so I could sustain. The last day, I failed. And I remember that day very, very clearly. The waves were rocking and rolling. And, and I remember it, I was just, my, my body, I, mean, I wanted to go, but my body couldn't keep up. And I was just telling myself, like, I can do this, I can do this. And I couldn't. And I just said to myself, I can do it, I can do it. And there were tears in my eyes. And I, was, I just said, I can do it, I can do it. I was bawling my eyes out. And this one guy, Manuel, he's a really nice guy. And uh, he's, he went from Cuba to Miami three times on a raft, failed twice, made it on a third. This guy's a really, really serious guy, really great guy, good heart. He goes, Nick, we like you. You got heart, but you can't do this job. And I felt miserable. They took me down back to town. I felt like a failure. The guys back in town, they were looking at me like I was fragile, and I absolutely hated it. And, you know, I said to myself, you know what, at least I tried, at least I gave it, you know, at least I gave it a shot. And I felt like, I, I felt horrible. A couple days later, I get a call from this guy, Antonio, big, tough, Samoan guy. And uh, he goes, hey, Nick, do you want to go halibut fishing? And uh, I go, well, I don't know if I can do the job. And uh, he says, well, I don't know, why don't you just show up tomorrow, see what happens. And this is where I meet Steve Russell. That's the guy right there. Former two-time Golden Glove boxing champion, all-state wrestling champion coming out of Nebraska. This guy was tough as nails, didn't take anything from anybody, but just he had a great heart and just an all-around good guy. I never met a better person in my life, I don't think. The guy, he fed me, he let me sleep on his boat. I was catching fish bigger than me. And the main thing that I cannot forget from this guy is he gave me the confidence that I can do this job. Next summer, I worked for this one guy, Brian Chelodinas. I had a job set for the next summer. He gave me the full share mentality like, listen, you're not just an employee here. You're part of a team. You do whatever you can to make this better. And that's where I get Now this, I toughened up a little bit. It's a scar between my eyes right from there. But I had to show you this. And let me see if I can get around to it. I couldn't put this on the PowerPoint right here, but I wanted to show you what Bristol Bay looked like because you'll, you won't see it on the show. There's 1,800 boats in the fleet right here. Boats ram each other, there are airplanes flying around, helicopters. It is just a sight to see. It is nuts. It is honestly by far my favorite fishery out there. I just wanted to show this to you guys. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to show that to you guys. That's it. So I went back on the Susan K with Steve, and I because he actually wanted me back, and I didn't know that, and I was really happy with it. Now, back with Steve, I was questioning crab fishing again. This has been three years ago, I failed at this job, and I had it in me like, should I do this again or should I not? And the high risk of death honestly prevented me because it's a really, really dangerous job. And but the, what I thought was, if I didn't do it 20 years down the road, I'd regret it and question myself, so I wouldn't be living, I'd merely be existing. So I decided I was going to do it. I had one job offer on the Acceler. This is a six-figure job. I turned it down for two reasons. One, because it was my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, and two, because I actually wanted to go crab fishing. I got a list of contacts from the Commercial Fishing Entries Commission. There were 72 boats left out of 280 boats looking for a job. Three people only gave me the time of day. Hip, Chevy Dave, and Kirby Mitchell. Chevy Dave, the first thing he asked me, he goes, well, let me see. I want to hire you, but I have to ask you, do you do drugs? I go, no, you drink. I go, no. He goes, come on, really, seriously? I go, no, I'm dead serious. And he goes, well, do you fight? I go, no. And he goes, well, I don't really want you working on my boat. Click. I, I was wondering why. He was just testing me to see how I was doing. I called him back. I'm like, honestly, I don't do this. I'm sorry if you want to keep hiring me, then that's fine. And then, you know, then he gave me the time of day. 
this other guy hit Bill Prout. Really, really good guy. And I didn't know that this guy's arguably like a legend on the boat. And uh, I said, listen, Bill, I mean, if I go up there, am I even going to get a job? And he goes, well, you're young. You can take risks. I mean, for me, if you get to my age, you can't really do that. And he goes, well, who have you worked for? Of course, you remember Brian? He gave me good marks. He goes, well, listen, Brian gave you good marks. If you come up here, I'll, you know, you can, uh, I'll pick you up from the airport. And he did, not like Jim. <laughs> and while I was flying up, though, I was nervous. Because my grandparents drove me to the airport, and I never forgot this because Right now, this is crab fishing. This is like the ultimate right here. I mean, I mean, there's so much competition. Every boat's practically filled with like you know, people like employees. So there's no sh really no shot almost. And my grandparents are like, listen, you know, we were nervous before, you know, about you, but for some reason we don't know how you do it, but you always land up on your feet. So I think you'll be okay. When I was on the plane, I was reading this book called The Way of the Three Peaceful Warrior, and the first page that came out of it was this. The important thing is this, to be ready at any moment to sacrifice what you are for what you could become. So that kind of reassured me right there. On the silver spray, Bill picked me up from the airport. I said, listen, let me at least show you that I'm a good worker. And because, I mean, he's putting, you letting me use him as a reference, I at least wanted to show him so that, you know, he could vouch for me. And I was out working this other guy, I remember. This guy was going to get fired anyway. He was, you know, he was faking an ankle injury and everything. And he wasn't going to cut out. I outwork him, and he, he got canned. I worked three days for free before Bill even considered to hire me, and I finally got the job. Now, while I was on there, I failed once before. I was going to give it all I had. I balanced sleep and eating to make sure that I would do this job. And I battled ice, I battled ice on the water, and after five months, I actually succeeded. I, I had it in me. I made it through the worst season on record. That's 2012, five months long with the exception of a 14-day break. This is all the paleo stuff, 55, 60, 60,000 pounds that I'm sitting on top of, actually, believe it or not. And uh, I, I did it, and I was really happy about that. Do you guys know who this guy is? No? On the show, this is, you know the Northwestern? Yeah, you know. Yeah, but I forgot the guy's name. That's OK. It's sick. That was the guy that got me up to Alaska. I remember I was sitting, I, I was, you know, sitting with my crew members, and he comes in and starts talking to him. And I was just looking at him that night, and uh, and uh, he looks at me. He goes, "Well, you've been looking at me the entire night. Why?" And I go, "Well, I just wanted to make sure you were who you were." And he goes, "Well, that's smart. Do you want to arm wrestle?" And I said, "Sure." <laughs> I lose. A couple of days later, he sees me again, kind of razzes at me a little bit. And I kind of throw some stuff back at him. And he kind of laughed. He came over, shook my hand, and said, my name's Sig. And all these guys are like taking pictures, signing auto trying to sign autographs with him. And he's talking to me, and I don't know why. I had a dilemma, though. He offered me a job, and I couldn't believe it. I had to pick between the Silver Spray or the Northwestern. Bill gave me the time of day when nobody else did. So I felt like I owed him. Like, I couldn't just walk away from a guy like that. I talked to Bill, and I said, Listen, Sig offered me a job, and I'm wondering if it's okay if I can go out with him. And he goes, well, no, Nick, I don't think it's okay. You're good with my family. You're good with my kids. You're not a drinker. You're not a drugger. You're a hard worker. I want to keep you around. So I stayed. You know, it was the hardest decision for me to make, but I called Sig, and I said, I'm sorry. I can't do it. I respect you. Thank you so much. Your boat, your boat was the one that got me up there, and I turned it down. But the whole time I was there, I actually wanted to, I saw that boat, and I wanted to be on it. I'm going to tell you guys my biggest mistake. Any of you guys know what this is? Oil? No? What's that? Oil? Close. Olive oil? Uh, Gasoline? Yes. Do you know what else is in there? Water. Water. I put water in the fuel tank. I lost my job. I'm telling you that. That's no joke. And I felt absolutely miserable. I got fired. It wasn't Bill that let me go. It was my superiors that let me go, like his superiors. And I basically, I stayed at my friend's house. I was like a cocoon for three days. I was so embarrassed with myself. I thought my career was over. And, 
And my friends finally said, like, listen, Nick, it's a mistake, yeah, but you're gonna have, you gotta eat, you gotta find a job. So I started walking the docks again, and I literally was walking like this, you know, look for, you know, other jobs, and, you know, another guy would, a guy would be there, and he goes, well, okay, you're looking for a job? Do you have any experience? I go, yeah. He goes, well, what boats have you worked on? I told him so much spray and everything. I went, why aren't you on that boat? I go, I put water in the fuel tank. I go, that was you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that was. And I was like, geez, like this. Nobody would give me the time of day. I walked the docks again, and then I, I went to Steve Branson's house. Remember that guy that taught me that? Well, you know, he gave me some sign work and everything. I go to see him, and I, you know, he looks at me. He's like, what's wrong with you? And I go, I don't, can't even tell you what I did. He goes, well, come on, go ahead. I go, all right. I put water in the fuel tank. He looks at me and goes, oh, well, I've done that. I was like, what? And he goes, yeah. He's like, sometime or another, somebody's going to make a mistake. It just happens. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. And I was like, all right, well, maybe I can call SIG. Maybe I can get a job. He's like, I don't know. Just call. So I call SIG. He said that there might be a spot for Blue King Brown. So if that, there was a maybe in there. That was good enough for me to go buy a plane ticket to go up there. For three days, I couldn't get out of Kodiak because of the weather. For three days, I was stuck in Anchorage because of the weather. There were three days left before the season. I was scared. I was wondering, am I actually going to get a job? I remember I was sitting out in Anchorage at, at a restaurant, and, uh, and I'll never forget this. Brian, he calls me up, my buddy. He goes, listen, Nick, I know you're going through a hard time, but just look outside for a second. And I did. And uh, he goes, look up. And that's what I saw. Those are the northern lights. That's what my buddy said to me. He goes, that's good luck, and I think you're going to be okay. And that was the only time I ever saw the northern lights, and I'll never forget that. I, went, I got, finally arrived into, into Dutch Harbor. There were three days left before the season. I was originally going to camp out because of 40, 45 mile an hour winds and heavy rain. I couldn't get stay in a tent, so I begged this guy to be able to rent a car so I can at least stay in a car for a few days. And the guy finally left me because I was under 25 and he left me and that was nice of him. And I was driving around and I see Sig in his boat and I just, I hit the throttle and I go over to see him. And I'm asking my family, you know, should I tell him, should I not tell him? And everyone's telling me don't tell him. And so, I mean, I'm just still at this moral dilemma and I see him and I go over to see him, I tie up his boat and I'm wondering, should I tell him, should I not tell him? And this was the thing that stuck in my head. I told him. I said, I put water in the fuel tank. And he goes, oh, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> Turns out two people on his boat made the same mistake I did. He goes, he, he let you go because you're expendable, right? I go, yeah. He goes, well, that's not so bad. Here, let me make a few phone calls. He didn't have a job for me. I felt like I gambled all in on everything and just got nothing. I'm there, and I'm just like, what the heck am I going to do? I'm, running out of money. I mean, I bought like every last dollar into a plane ticket and I had like maybe just, I don't know, a thousand bucks left, which is really not much. And uh, a couple days later, some guy gets injured on this boat. Revolution number one, they say they need a fill-in guy for two weeks. I work on that boat. This is brown king crab. It is by far the craziest fishery you will ever see. You, got, you see the show when you have like one pot going off the launcher, right? Like, picture this, you have a whole long line of 800 pound pots going off the stern in a cutout hole in a long line. Bam, 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 bam. Like 50 pots just going right out the side, like in one long line. Yeah, that's this. And if people get injured all the time. You can make a killer amount of money, but it's really dangerous. I got off that boat after, as soon as the other guy came in. I still didn't have a job. I contacted the Northwestern. I was on a radio, and I remember like, I, I found a boat, I got on a radio, and I was able to contact them. 10 minutes later, I got a, I got a signal back saying, we're gonna need a background check and everything. And I was just thrilled, psyched, and everything. I get a call a couple days later saying that they're gonna hire me. They don't know when they're gonna be back in port, but they say wait at the docks for us. So I did, I waited 16 hours every day for three days, but it was so freezing outside that I had to run in and out of the bathroom it was so cold. Finally, they get over there, and I got the job. And I was on board, and they were the nicest people I could possibly imagine. 
And, I, and this is not for you guys. This is actually for me. Because, like, I remember, I remember this. I, 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 like, I was, the, I, I, was, I was standing in a corner, and I was just so happy. I forgot there was a microphone on me. And I, I, was, I started crying, bawling my eyes out. And, and, uh, and I, I couldn't believe that the mic was there, and the camera saw it, and I saw I was crying and everything. But the thing was that I was like, four years ago, I saw a boat on TV that got me up to Alaska, and now I'm on it. And that was just nuts. After everything I went through, after staying at the home the shelter, after countless people telling me I couldn't do it, after pawning like the gold necklace my mom gave to me, all the mistakes I did, I finally landed on my dream job. And they nicknamed me Sunshine because I couldn't wipe a smile away from my face. And what I wanted to ask is, is the coincidence or just the right place at the right time so many times? I read the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss, which pushes me to stand up for my family and go after what I want. I read The Alchemist, which is about a young man going on an adventure, the same thing as me. I arrive without a place to stay, someone helps me out, boom, gone. I had a staph infection on my knee, but if I didn't have that, I probably would have been that guy with a blown up stomach. I had the job on the Silver Spray, the first boat that I got on, it's a really competitive spot, and there just so happened to be that one guy wasn't going to work on that boat. Had I not put water in the fuel tank, would I have gotten that job on the Northwestern? No. Probably not. So the last thing I got out of the Alchemist was this, that when a person really desires something, all the universe conspires to help that person realize his dream. So the message to you guys is that I want you to follow your heart. You push through whatever obstacles you may face and go after what you want. Don't let anybody tell you different. And, and if you go after that, that's what I believe will in turn will make you happy. If you don't, the world will be deprived of the gifts you have to offer. You want to be an author? Be an author. You know? I mean, you guys, programmer, you know, EMT engineer, go do that. That's what you want to do. Don't, don't settle. Don't do anything else besides that. And that's what I wanted to say. And, and honestly, along there, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to have people tell you you can't do it. And the thing is, is just keep going. If you really want it bad enough, you'll get it. And that's all I have to say. And thank you, and thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.